Hey guys, I'm back to do another meta review after my trip to South Africa. And uh, this week I've got 12 decks. We're going to start things off with a budget deck and then go over the best of three tournament winners and then the best of one uh, according to the untapped tracker. So to start things off here, we've got a budget Is It Artifacts deck that was uh, made by Saffron Olive on MTG Goldfish. And um, it's running, it's kind of like the Rakdos sacrifice theme, but instead of running the anvil, we're leaning heavily on the Gleaming Gear Drake, which is a 1 1 flyer that when it enters the battlefield, it creates a clue token. And then whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a plus one plus one counter on Gleaming Gear Drake. So you can create, you know, you've got the artifact generators like the Voldaren Epicure, the Spyglass Siren that creates a map token. And then you've got cards like Voltage Surge where you can sacrifice the artifact and then grow your Gleaming Gear Drake every time that you're sacrificing an artifact. We've also got Case of the Filched Falcon, which can make, uh, put four plus one plus one counters on a artif non-creature artifact, and it becomes a bird uh, with flying. Make a map token into like a 4-4 flyer. We've got the Mishra's Research Des Desk, which allows you to um, dig and sacrifice an artifact, triggering the Gleaming Gear Drake. Um, we've got Sir Ginger, which whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So it, along with the Gleaming Gear Drake, just, you know, starts to grow. We've got the Demand Answers, which is the uh, kind of like a Reckless Impulse kind of thing, right? Just for additional draw, um, discard some cards. Disruption Protocol is straight up a counter spell. If you um, have an artifact or you can pay one, make it into a cancel. So with how many artifacts you have in this deck, you can... It's usually just straight up counter spell for two. We've got the subter subterranean schooner, which is good for making your evasive creatures like the spyglass siren into a bigger and bigger threat, and then as an artifact as well. Then we've got one witch stalker frenzy here for a little bit of point removal and some land fixing for is it um, space. Now there are it is a fair amount of rares, uh, but the reason why it's labeled as budget is because it is um, it, you know the paper price of the deck is quite cheap. Um, it is a best of three list, so the sideboard has two disdainful strokes, uh, three negates, which you're going to be bringing in against your control matchups, anything with like Sunfall, uh, Domain, etc. Uh, two more copies of the Witch Stalker Frenzy if you need a little bit more point removal, and then Flame Blessed Bolt as well as a Braid, or a, a good for additional point removal, or if you need some artifact hate. We've got Urbrask's Forge, which can be a pretty good card to bring in um, and then this gives you some just late game inevitability and some answers to if your opponent is running something like sunfall and is missing that artifact hate and we have one more copy or so a fourth copy of sorry a third copy of witch stalker's frenzy for a total of four um in the list all right, now for the best of three tournament winners and first place for the standard challenge 32 on march 30th goes to and 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 rw1232 <laughs> and with demir midrange and so if we compare this to the list um in week six which was the last time that i covered my meta review um we can see that the list is exactly the same as far as the main board and the lands are concerned all of the changes are occurring here in the sideboard so they've ditched the one copy of the Kaido Shizuki, and they're running an additional copy of Liliana of the Veil, and um, bringing in one, dis uh, yeah, one more copy of Disdainful Stroke, as well as one copy of Unlicensed Hearse, dropping the two copies of Duress, and bringing in an additional copy of Spell Pierce, dropping the one copy of Negate, and one copy of Gix's Command and bringing in a, a third copy of the Glistening Deluge, and bringing in one Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal sideboard, and cutting the one copy of the Graveyard Trespasser. And if you kind of want to know what the, uh, the best, <laughs> what these cards are best at in which uh, matchups and stuff, uh, I did do a best of three sideboard guide for the Demir midrange, and um, kind of covers up what, when you're going to bring, be bringing in these cards. Second place for the standard challenge 32 on March 30th goes to Nameless Thing, running Domain. And if we compare this one again to the one that I covered in week six, we can see that there's been a couple of changes. So they're dropping one copy of the Invasion of Zendikar down to two, 
as well as cutting Spelunking down from three copies to two copies and bringing in the two copies of Depopulate and uh, bringing a mountain into the main, cutting one plains and bringing in a Rafine's tower while cutting one of the Spara's headquarters down by one. And then as far as the best of three sideboard goes, we've got three copies of Long Goodbye, which is one we have not seen very often as a sideboard option. And then we're bringing uh, two copies of the Stone Brain, which is particularly good if your opponent has one key card as their win condition. And then we're going to be cutting, uh, bringing in one more copy of the Kutzil's Flanker. This one is good for anti-graveyard synergies. And... Um, and then we were bringing out, let's see, a temporary lockdown from four copies down to three. This one's largely your answer for Boros Convoke. And then we're taking out the two copies of Jace, the Perfected Mind, as well as the two copies of the Wandering Emperor, and bringing and taking out two copies of Destroy Evil, and bringing in one copy of Elish Norn, Mother of Machines. And um, this is another one that I have covered for the best of three sideboard guide will be coming out this Friday. So uh, look for that going over the kind of cards that are really good. Elish Norn specifically, I was curious to see if this one was going to make it into a list. And so I was happy to see it there. Third place was taken down by Demir Control by Fair MTG, F-E-R MTG. And um, this one's a new archetype, so we haven't seen uh, this one before. Uh, we, we've seen Esper Control, and this is similar to that, but we don't have the No More Lies as the counter spell. Basically, we've got point removal up the wazoo, right? We've got cut downs, we've got go for the throats, we've got duress, we've got long goodbye, children's edict, uh, a, you know, two copies of negate, two copies of make disappear. So counter spells and targeted removal, deduce for a little bit of card draw. Siphon Insight to use your opponent's deck against them. Uh, the Celestis for life gain and filtering to find your threats. One copy of the Chromeho Seed Shark and um, one Wrath in the form of Path of Peril. Well, actually, I should say uh, two copies of Path of Peril. There's also the Deadly Cover-Up, which is another Wrath, where you can also kind of get a Stone Brain or Pithing Needle effect where you, if you collect Evidence 6, then you can remove everything from a graveyard hand and library. So it's really good for answering those decks that have one specific threat. Then we've got Memory Deluge, and then our really our one win con outside of like <laughs> the Manlands and killing them with Chromehost Sea Shark is to mill them with Jace the Perfected Mind. So, um, and then we've got, yeah, just fixing for Demir as well as some of the, like the Restless Reef Manland, Mirix. And then for the sideboard, we've got one copy of Duress, two copies of Negate, a Siphon Insight, uh, two more copies of Chromeho Seed Shark, one more copy of Jace the Perfected Mind, two copies of Tishana's Tidebinder, two copies of the Malicious Eclipse, two copies of Shieldred the Apocalypse, and two copies of Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal. So then the next uh, segment here <laughs> for the standard challenge 64 was taken down by three different copies or three different versions of teamer control. And so first place um, was by TX EPI and it took down first place on March 31st. And this one is sort of similar to it has a lot of similarities to the soul tie landfall deck with Slogurk, but instead is running red. Um, instead of black and going in so that we can bring in an additional wrath of ill-timed explosion and um, lean kind of heavily into the virtue of strength which, um, allows us to take advantage of the cards that we've milled from like the philosophy archaeologist the aftermath analysis and um, bring the great bring those lands back to play and then make it so that those lands tap for three times as much mana you get, you get a huge amount of mana. And then the question is, is what do you do with that mana to win? Some lists were like exploring like Doppelgang and things like that. But this one is doing World Souls Rage, which allows you to deal X damage to any target. And then also allow you to put X lands from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield tapped. So it, it, all, it, it fits into the aftermath analyst kind of mill strategy. And then we've got Nissa Resurgent Animist, which was part of that Soltai landfall. Similar to here, we're going to be running the... Uh, Cabaretti courtyards and such that when they enter you sacrifice them and gain a life 
And because of how often you're cycling this, this can actually lead to a fair amount of life gain to help stabilize against aggro. Um, this, uh, this person was bringing in Kellen, Inquisitive Prodigy, which helps us with the kind of the land ramp strategy as well. Um, we've got Vampire's Vengeance to do the board wipe against like Boros Convoke. Uh, Memory Deluge to hit additional threats. So um, as far as the sideboard goes, we've got it, it's kind of it's not very focused. It's a little bit all over the place, in my opinion. <laughs> like, like we've got one copy of In the Festivities, uh, one copy of Turn the Earth, three copies of Negate, two copies of the Tranquil Frillback, a Lithomanic Barrage, three copies of a Braid, one Shigeki, I Visionary, the third copy of uh, Vampire's Vengeance in the sideboard, Itania, Voice of Gaia, and then a uh, single copy of Doppelgang as an alternative win condition. So second place was taken down by Giga Chad Sigma Male of <laughs> Teamwork Control. And uh, if we compare this one to the one that won first place, we can see this one was not running the two copies of Kellen Inquisitive Prodigy, as well as deciding to take the two copies of Vampire's Vengeance out. And instead, we're bringing in one copy of a braid in the main, um, one copy of the Galvanic Iteration, which allows you to copy an inst your next instant or sorcery spell so you can end up doubling up on a World Soul's Rage or your win condition. Um, we've also got Splendid Reclamation, which is a way to trigger kind of like the Aftermath Analyst returning all of your cards from your graveyard to the battlefield, which then triggers the Courtyard to sacrificing and like thin your deck of all of your lands. And then we've got one copy of Spelunking, which allows our lands to enter the battlefield not tapped. And um, if you were playing a cave, you would gain four life, but there are no caves in here. They're all just lands. So I'm kind of curious about why the Spelunking is in there. It allows you to play an additional card from your hand. So it's just like the land ramp, I suppose. Um, as far as the best of three sideboard goes, they are running the same exact sideboard, except for they have two copies of Vampire's Vengeance in the sideboard, none in the main. And they've gone down one copy of a braid because they've moved it from the sideboard to the main. Otherwise, same list. And then the third version of Teamwork Control was done by L1X0. They won third place. And if we compare this one to the one that won first place, we can see that they've brought the Shigeki Jukai Visionary into the main, as well as brought in the Colossal Sky Turtle, which is a way to loop infinitely through your graveyard with these two cards. You can use the Sky Turtle to bring back the Shigeki, Shigeki to bring back the Turtle, and uh, just, you know, so it allows you to have some interesting graveyard loops. Um, as far as what was cut for it, though, we dropped one copy of the Nissa Resurgent Animist. And uh, also, this one is also not running the two copies of Kellen. Uh, also not running the two copies of Falaji Archaeologist. And it is bringing in the one Splendid Reclamation, as well as two copies of Spelunking. And then as far as the lands go, we're bringing in one copy of the Echoing Depths, um, which allows you to which does give you a little, like at least one little cave synergy for Spelunking. <laughs> and then um, we're also bringing in uh, down one forest. So as far as the best of three sideboard goes, we've ditched the one copy of In the Festivities and brought in an additional copy of the Lithomanic Barrage. Dropped one copy of Negate, so only two there. Uh, brought Shigeki from the sideboard into the main. Ditched Titania, Voice of Gaia, uh, which kind of makes sense to me if you're not going to try to meld it. Um, it's kind of... I th it was a little bit of a head scratcher why it was there in the first place. Um, bringing in two copies of the Tishana's Tidebinder works particularly well against certain matchups, Planeswalkers and like Boros Convoke. Um, and we're bringing out one copy of the Tranquil Frillback and bringing in one copy of the Borgamos and Fibblethip, which I thought was fun to see since we are in Teamer, why not? <laughs> and then uh, one copy of the Tyrannix Rex as an alternative win condition. So that does it for the best of three segment. And now we're going to go into the best of one segment. Uh, I like to keep my eye on what are the top performing decks in best of one, according to untapped, which is a tracker that tracks magic, the gathering data. And so the number one performing deck in best of one is mono red aggro. 
and it's really been it's been kind of Boros Convoke gave it a run for its money for a little bit there, but then Boros uh, uh, the uh, mono red aggro overtook it as number one. And part of it is the hand smoother, right? Like ultra aggro strategies that are monocolored tend to be a little bit favored in best of one. Um, but if we compare this to the list that I covered in week six before I took my vacation, we can see that they are running three copies of Felden Ronan Excavator instead of two, ditching one copy of Squee Dubious Monarch, uh, ditching one copy of Lightning Strike, which I thought was interesting, and uh, ditching the two copies of Nahiri's Warcrafting, which works with the... Um, uh, blanking on the name of it, the, the, the two-cost 2-2 two -two Haster... Um, that one works particularly well. We're not running that, so we're running the Witch Stalker's Frenzy. And then um, we are ditching one copy of Sokinzon, Crucible of Defiance, I thought was interesting. And we're bringing in one mountain instead. So it, I, I wonder why there's just, you know, like, it seems free to be able to just run a legendary one of red land that can sometimes trigger for Godric and whatnot. Um, but that was what this list was running. So here it is. Number two, according to Untapped, is Boros Convoke, and if we compare this one to the one that I covered in week five, we can see that um, they're deciding to bring, bring in one more copy of Lunark Veteran, ditch one copy of the Imidane's Recruiter, which I thought was kind of interesting, because like, so Imidane's Recruiter is usually your win condition, um, it, you know, it being able to put, create more damage, uh, give everything plus one plus zero in haste, can hit for an incredible amount of damage out of nowhere, and... Um, but one of the things that's kind of unfortunate is when you have two or three Imidane's recruiters in your hand and not of your other 1-1 one, one generators, right? So um, I thought that dropping the recruiter down to three was... I can get behind and explore that. Same thing with the Knight Errant of Eos, right? Like when you have a hand that's just full of Knight Errants of Eos but none of your cheap stuff, it can be a little bit awkward as well. So dropping that down to three and... Um, then as far as the lands go, we've got there's been a debate about whether or not Thran Portal should be involved because you do need a turn one red source as well as a turn white turn one white source. Uh, this one is not going with that. So we're cutting the four copies of the Thran Portal as well as the three copies of the Battlefield Forge, which is the red white pain land. And uh, we're bringing in an additional copy of Merix up to two and then bringing in one mountain and four planes as well as two more copies of Sundown Pass, so for a total of four. And I'm I'm a little hesitant on this Sundown's Pass over Thran Portal because when I played it, I, f I found the Sundown Pass to be detrimental in being able to have the mana untapped that I needed for the early plays. Now, it's possible that there, you know, people have played it out enough and I... Um, that it's not actually that detrimental. If you do lose a turn, the deck still can close a little bit later, even if you like stumble a little bit. So, uh, because the Thran portals do have a price, right? I mean, they're going to make you worse against other matchups like Mono Red. So, uh, I'd be curious to give this one a shot and see how it plays. All right, number three on the list is Lesnia Enchantments, and we've covered this one before. This one took a, a slightly different. Uh, approach. So this this list has been around for a long time. I think it's relatively uh, fully optimized for best of one. We haven't really seen very much variation in the main board, but we do still have a little bit of room about like what's the best way to go about it with lands. And so um, this one's not running Boseju, who endures. It's not running a Ganjo, Seed of the Empire, which are the green and white legendary lands. Um, we're running only two copies of Brushland. And instead, running two more forests and two more plains, and bringing in one overground farmland and cutting one Razor Verge thicket. So uh, we've seen kind of uh, in the past dropping brushlands entirely and running an additional forest and plains. And um, so this was not, this one's uh, no, yet again a, a third variation, but the only variation is occurring in the lands. All right, number four is Azorius Control. And if we compare this one to week six, we do see some changes. So Wandering Emperor cut down from four copies to three, uh, ditching the one copy of Archangel Elspeth, bringing in three copies of the Hornlock Whale, and cutting one copy of March of Otherworldly Light, and bringing in three more copies of Deduce for some good card draw. 
ditching the two copies of Get Lost as targeted removal, as well as two copies of Sunset Revelry, which I've found to be helpful against the mono red matchup, um, and cutting the four copies of Dissipate and one copy of Temporary Lockdown, as well as the two copies of Depopulate, um, to bring in two additional copies of Sunfall, uh, three copies of the Disruption Protocol, uh, two, two copies of the Celestis, and then as far as the planes er, lands go, we've dropped one planes, one sea chrome coast, and two sunken citadels, which were being explored for their synergies with the restless lands, um, deciding to not go that direction, and instead lean more heavily into the field of ruin to attack enemy uh, Mirix and such, and then two copies of the meticulous archive. So the number five was Orsov Lifegain, which is the same list as the one that I covered in week two of Murders at Karlov Manor. Um, Mono Black Aggro was number six. It was the same list as the one that I covered in week three, except for one change, which was it was deciding to run two less, uh, dropping two copies of Mishra's Foundry for two swamps. So nothing substantial there. Um, then what we see, Mono White Humans is one that I haven't covered since uh, week three of Murders at Karlov Manor, and this one's number seven. And this one, we're bringing in one copy of the Hopeful Initiate, one more copy of Skrelv Defector Might, cutting the two copies of Warden of the Inner Sky, and bringing in the old favorite of Spellbook Vendor, as well as a fourth copy of Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, and... Um, I, you know, I think Mono White's actually positioned pretty well. It, it's, it's not a very popular pick, um, but but Thalia can absolutely just crush the dreams of the um, Azorius control. So um, we're cutting two copies of the Sanguine Evangelist. So kind of going just back to the old, the older build of Mono White humans um, by cutting the, the Sanguine Evangelist as well as the Warden of the Inner Sky. Uh, four copies of Knight Errant of Eos, so bringing in an additional one there. Cutting the two copies of Ossification and one copy of Mishra's Foundry and bringing in one Plains. And then the last one that I was tempted, you know, always like to keep an eye on was Mono Blue Tempo, which was number eight. And that one is a budget list that's even cheaper as far as like rares and why, uh, mythics go. And that was the same list that I covered in week three and can highly recommend. So. Thanks for watching to the end of my video. Um, remember to hit like and subscribe. It's the best way to help support me. And I just want to say thank you to my um, members for joining here on YouTube as a way to help me uh, help support me in, in my endeavors. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, if it's something that interests you, you could check it out by clicking join below. There's like a little trailer that, you know, talks about what you get for different tiers and whatnot. And um, but I, I really appreciate the support and um, I'll be putting up a poll for the next best of one archetype it will be one of the best of one decks that I just showcased here today. And then I will be finishing up the best of three sideboard guide uh, by covering mono red aggro next week. So um, I'm looking for Tamir, Tamir control, but right now it's a little bit sparse as far as the data is concerned. Um, so we'll, I'll keep an eye on that and then be able to do one of those as soon as I can. So um, take care, everybody. Good luck with your matches, and maybe I'll see you on the ladder.